Reykjavik on the way home uh, but before I forget um, once in a while it comes up that I'm disappearing from the radar or whatever uh, application you're using to track me uh, well in Oceanic there is no radar mostly there is uh, reporting so for example uh, here I had to report passing uh, longitude uh, 13 no 13 west basically that's how it's called so that's how it really works um, now toward Greenland and and um, Canada there is even less radar so there I have to report uh, every other longitude so that's how it worked uh, this way Uh, the airports in Greenland, Greenland on Sundays are closed so I have to wait till tomorrow or whatever uh, whenever the weather permits me to go but uh, my next stop would be Kulushuk and as I mentioned there Kulushuk is really not an airport that uh, I want to get into IMC or instrument uh, that's uh, that's uh, in my opinion that's a pretty dangerous airport. Yesterday morning I left Norway, flew all the way to the Faroe Islands. The flight was uh, very very difficult. Uh, out of the four hours, three hours were all IMC. I got quite a bit of icing. Um, my static port iced up. All of a sudden my VSI. Uh, my uh, altimeter and my uh, speed gauge uh, just went haywire and started flipping back and forth. Uh, opened the static port but it really didn't help much. But after a while uh, the, um, it fell, the, I guess the, uh, the ice fell off and uh, so everything was back to normal, but it was an interesting experience. So, yeah, Var, you know, the flight to Vagar was, uh, like I said, was pretty, pretty hard and pretty difficult, you know, very intense. Uh, the approach, on the other hand, you know, for runway one, two, I believe, if I remember well, was really nice. It's, it's, it's going, it's, uh, it's a, an offset approach to the runway through a fjord and I'm, I'm gonna post a video here this script it's pretty cool it's nice On the way from the Faroe Islands to Norway, the flight was equally hard and difficult, uh, maybe even worse. Um, from, uh, from Norway to Vagar, I get a lot of rain, ice and everything. And I believe maybe all that ice some, and, and water seeped all the way onto my uh, trim cable and climbing up. Uh, you know, since I'm going a little bit further north, uh, the, the temperatures are getting colder and colder at lower altitudes. So as I was climbing, I trimmed out the airplane. But uh, I got quite a bit of ice, I believe, on my uh, trim cable because, I, you know, I just noticed that my trim is getting harder and harder to trim and eventually I was unable to trim. And obviously, 
so you know I, I, I figure this is only this can only be ice so what happened is uh, on you know this icing happened on a climb out so now the airplane is a climbing configuration and try to fly straight and level in a climbing configuration so it was very very hard and difficult because especially on my wrists and hands you know to keep pushing the yoke forward to keep the airplane once in a while the only thing I could do is just reduce power and let it sink you know to give it a little bit of a break for my wrists you know because it was very hard to push but uh, as soon as I well, oh yeah and uh, I couldn't even descend any lower because I was already over the uh, Iceland glaciers so you know there's no way to to descend to warmer temperatures where the ice can just thaw off but once I passed those uh, glaciers you know I descended to 6,000 initially and everything started to go back to normal but you know it's just an interesting little thing you know that I never even thought I, I, I oiled the cables before I left but I guess oil can be washed off or whatever so I think uh, grease would be the perfect or a better solution than anything else Check this out, it looks like a Viking ship. It's pretty cool. Love it. I'm looking at this harbor with the light winds, calm waters. I would love to sail this with one of my boats or the canoe or the kayak or whatever. I talked to the line service guys. They said they have oxygen, which I ran out of uh, earlier. Uh, on the trip to Hungary uh, but I definitely need it flying across uh, Greenland um, I cannot get Kulushuk out of my head uh, that runway and uh, approach is on a technical scale is very very difficult 2000 2500 feet mountains on the sides uh, is an offset approach it's pretty pretty difficult and I know that um, <clears throat> the, it is, the weather can change there very fast and the visibility can turn zero zero and basically ceiling is ground so if I can I'm even thinking maybe to fly from Reykjavik to Nook or whatever the closest west coast city or airport but I don't know I mean I have to catch the right winds tailwinds to get there because even though I have quite a bit of fuel it's still it's a huge risk and like I said I'm crazy not stupid so I don't not sure I want to take that amount of risk Eventually, I caved in and bought a rocket route, and I think that was one of the best decisions I made. Even though it's expensive, I believe three or four hundred dollars, but it's very nice, at least for <coughs> us U.S. pilots. The point of rocket route is really I put in the origin and the destination, and it comes back from Brussels, the preferred route and every time uh, it was accepted of course the European flight plans are about six miles long you know every even if you get a, <coughs> a, a how should I say almost like a Victor Airway or, or whatever GPS route you still get a bunch of fixes in it and every single one of them they say it's direct but still rocket route was pretty awesome or is still pretty awesome because it works really nice um, <coughs> of course the deal with like every flight plan you get a flight plan you get a departure procedure and a, you know 
Sid and everything else, but hey, the moment you're airborne, it's pretty much up to the controllers and about four or five hundred, well, thousand feet up, you get a different vectors and especially over here north, you get a lot of direct and that's very nice. So you can save a lot of time instead of going every single one of the fixes that Rocket Route or Brussels came back, you know, they, the controllers know better and that's very nice. They get, they, pretty much every time I got a, a bunch of directs, 100, 200 miles out, so that was very, very cool. Uh, so, it was good. Even though on the Cherokee the green arc in the speed indicator is all the way to 140 or whatever, so you don't need carb heat, that is not the case all the time. I noticed uh, my engine going pretty rough, and after a while, uh, you know, I was just not getting any power. So I was suspecting ice. Although, why would it get ice? You know, that's what the manufacturer says. But still, I pulled the carb heat all the way out. Of course, that reduces the RPM and the power. Uh, you know, I'm oceanic. I, you know, nobody really cares, you know, whether 1,000 feet or whatever altitude I'm flying. In any case, uh, I ran it like 10, 15 minutes like that and then pulled it back. And hey, I got my power back. So... It is an interesting uh, situation that even though that's what the manufacturer is showing and whatever that you know you don't need car feed in an airplane but that's not the case sometimes that's just you gotta think beyond what's uh, you know what the book says not necessarily aviation related but really part of the trip so I gotta iron my pilot shirt out. I don't want my mom to see it and say, hey, didn't I teach you something? So, I gotta look nice. Luckily, I have an iron here in the hotel room. That's cool. This is Reykjavik Beach, right by the airport, runway 01. And that's a geothermal pool.